So we do these virtual office meetings every day at 10 o'clock and two o'clock. So if you guys ever have questions or whatever, this is a great forum to come on. You usually have a lot of brokers here and it's usually, mostly it's us just staring at each other talking. So um, if you guys make a note of it, this is a good place to come and get some, some help on anything you need. And if you're lonely, it's a good place to connect with people, you know. Stare into Chris's eyes. That's right. So I, I'll, I'll get started. Um, so appreciate you guys taking the time. Of course, last night was pretty hectic for anyone in uh, realtor leadership. Um, I had a heads up about uh, a day before that the governor was going to be talking about some open house issues. Of course, he's been getting uh, texts and emails from, from people sending pictures of people violating uh, his order by out, you know, playing golf, uh, playing out at parks and things like that. So uh, we've been getting a lot of uh, feedback and information from the AG's office that the governor was taking this pretty seriously as he should, and that uh, he was going to be coming out with some stronger restrictions just based on the way that people were acting and, and things that were going on. I read an article just a little while ago saying that uh, Clark County was one of the best areas in the country as far as the shut down and those that were um, quarantining themselves. So uh, ironically, if we're the best and we're still having these issues, that should lead you to believe what the rest of the country is going through. So the big item uh, last night was, um, of course, uh, no more open houses. So granted, um, I built my real estate business from open houses. It was my number one lead generator, uh, but the governor feels that there is no uh, good reason to have a, a actual physical open house. Um, he's completely supportive of virtual open houses. He's completely supportive of, you know, touring properties with your iPhone, posting that picture, anything that you can do um, that would, you know, bring a prospective buyer and seller together. He's completely supportive as long as it's virtually done and uh, putting them in person is not the first priority. The big uh, secondary item, which was the most misinformation that went out there, is the governor's actual order, which is section six of an order I'll post to you later today if you haven't seen it, uh, was for the protection of tenants. Uh, tenants that are in a property that they're occupying that may either be for sale or being shown uh, for sale. And so the AG's office uh, worked with the state association uh, right up until about 30 minutes before the governor's announcement. And I think that's probably why he was late is because he was still following a few of the communication chains to work out the wording. Uh, was just to protect tenant occupied properties only from being shown. So basically what that means is if you have a property um, and your seller uh, is an investor and they've agreed to sell it and you went and negotiated with the tenant and got their permission to show the home, you can no longer show that property. So even if they put in writing that I'm okay with showing the home, the AG's office says they don't care. They look at it that the tenant co could have been coerced by the owner, which we don't know that we agree with but they've made this restriction so that no tenant can be asked or required to show their home during this time. So I know that's gonna affect a lot of you. Uh, there's 790 properties that are tenant occupied right now uh, in the MLS that would not be able to be shown. So first point is what do I do if I have that listing? I would probably communicate with the seller uh, and with the tenant, letting them know about the order. And again, we'll provide it on the feed, but you would probably want to put that property into T status uh, for at least the next 30 days until it could be shown. Um, there is wording in the order that you could ask, and I, I need to be care very careful with this, you could ask politely for the tenant to provide you with video or photos of the property. So if a buyer wanted to see it and you wanted to see what the sun looked like during the morning or what the sunset looked like in the afternoon uh, through the windows, you could ask the tenant for a photo but they cannot be forced to provide it to you. So if they say, no, I don't wanna give you anything, I'm not gonna do anything until this is lifted, they are completely within their rights to do so. So I know that that's gonna take a lot of uh, communication on your part with them. Um, the other thing is that if the property is seller occupied, so you have a traditional listing, which we have another 2000 properties on the market right now that are owner occupied, you can still show those homes by appointment only. Now I think that it's important because of this, there's gonna be a lot of sellers that heard the governor say last night, no showings. And that was the miscommunication. There are showings allowable by appointment, but it only was tenant occupied properties that are completely unallowable. Owner, owner occupied properties are still allowed to be shown, um, but I think that you need to follow the guidelines of the uh, COVID-19 risk mit mitigation practice, which was also part of the order. And the first showing of a property should not be physical. It should be photos and virtual tours. 
And you need to be able to show that you did that first, that you've actually followed the risk mit mitigation practice before you take a, pro a, a buyer out to see the home. So we all know that when I get a buyer in my office, I first am gonna pull up the MLS and find properties. They wanna make sure that we're doing everything we can virtually before we put those two people together inside of a residence. I also think that if you have a seller in a property and you're the listing agent, you should properly recommend to your seller that they not be in the home when it's shown if possible. And I know there are people that are particular about that. They don't like people in their home without them. And I think that if you have a seller who says, listen, after what I saw last night, I have no desire right now to show my home. I think that that's understandable. And I think that if we have a lot of issues because of this, the governor could have gone all the way and said no showings at all. And we're on a paper thin um, margin that he may do that in the next coming weeks. And so if we hear a lot of complaints, if we have a lot of issues within agents in our industry that are causing problems with this, I probably feel the AG's office will pull that restriction too and not allow any showings at all. I had some communication last night with Tom Blanchard, our local association president who put out a pretty good video about uh, the information that we had. He was pretty upset at me that he didn't know about all this ahead of time. And I said, well, you can be upset at me all you want because you knew about as much as I did going into the governor's announcement and even the order didn't match what the governor said. And he's like, okay, well, I guess that's understandable. But the whole point about this is that we need to be cognizant of people are gonna be in very different positions emotionally. And so if you have a, a client, a buyer, a seller that you know, uh, is a little hesitant about seeing homes or a seller about showing homes, you're gonna have to do everything you can uh, to work around them and make it work for them. Um, so again, uh, I'm gonna post a couple of things. I'm gonna post the governor's order so you can see that section. I'm gonna post the COVID-19 risk mitigation practice. And basically it says everything everyone's been telling you, do whatever you can to keep people apart and in uh, very small groups. And of course, we've been telling you, you know, try to do everything you can to do things virtually. Um, the good news is there's still 2,600 homes in the marketplace that are vacant that you could show without any of those issues or restrictions. Um, and, you know, it should lead to a, a little bit simpler process. But again, uh, this is all to protect the tenants. And with that being said, I'm happy to answer your questions. Chris, let, let me let me ask. Uh, you said that it was probably a, a good practice to put all of your tenant occupied properties in this T status. Um, could they put? Could they just change the showing instructions to no show, and then put something in agent agent remark that says right off, you know, right offers contingent upon uh, future inspection or something like that? You could. Um, the only issue that you're going to deal with. We know that agents don't read and they don't pay attention. So whether you put it in T or something else, if you have an agent that goes out and harasses your tenant, that's going to put even you as the listing agent in a bad situation. So it is completely up to the listing agent. I think no show and write offer subject to inspection makes sense. But even if you write the offer subject to inspection, you're going to have to give it until this order is lifted. Because even if the offer is accepted, and even if you got the tenant to agree to allow it, it still would be defying the actual order. And that was something we fought with the AG about. So that would mean we'd have to wait until after the order is lifted, which right now is set for April 30th. If they got extended until May, you could physically have a contract that you would have to keep extending your inspection provision, but you could absolutely do it. We even said, you know, what about if the tenant has agreed in writing to let me into the property? The AG doesn't care, but it would be a broker's practice. You know, if the tenant was happy and didn't say anything, who would know? But again, as a brokerage, I think it's important to point out the fact that we don't want to put you into any litigation. And they're looking to make examples of agents out there that are violating this. So just be extremely careful what you do. But yeah, you could definitely put it in new show. Chris, we got a question from Tanya. Actually, you just answered it. So I just took my hand off. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Chris. Okay, Chris. So I have a tenant occupied home. I, I just got an offer last night. They haven't seen it. It's subject to visual inspection. Uh, if we accept it, can I let the buyers in there to visually inspect it? Is the tenant in the property? Yep. No. That's the exactly the scenario that they're not going to allow, which I, I'll be honest with you, it makes no sense to me why not. But that was a point that they made a multiple times that that exact scenario because of what's going on. They do not want anyone forcing the tenant, even if it's not forcing, even if they say, oh yeah, come in, no problem. They do not want the scenario to even be brought up. So I think in that instance, since you have an offer that's gonna be accepted, 
you have to go and let your seller know, hey, listen, I didn't cause this, you know, uh, call the governor if you have an issue with it, but uh, we need to extend this inspection period or just the contract time frame uh, to allow for this all to be worked out and be like 25 days. That, well, that kind of leaves it open to, I mean, it could theoretically be extended for three months or, or more. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be in the seller's best interest to accept something like that with no definitive uh, end date, right? I completely agree with what you just said. I mean, your seller's going to get less offers now too because people can't see it. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I think to consider is, you know, we don't know what, what's going to happen to home value. So if you put something in contract today and what the value is, if there was a small dip, you know, you're at least protected at that price. Not saying that the buyer wouldn't come back at another time and ask for a small price reduction if that did happen. But I mean, I've been looking at it like, protecting the purchase price uh, of some of the contracts that we've had to extend is why we've decided to extend them is because we want to protect the price that was, that was offered at the time three, you know, three weeks ago or two weeks ago or, or today, because we don't know what happens in 30 days. Yeah. Got a question from Jay and Andrew's on deck. Go ahead, Jay. Jay, you there? Andrew, you're up. <laughs> He's trying to uh, click this. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. This says for showings, what if it's a home that's already in contract that needs to be inspected or appraised? Yeah, so does it have a tenant in it? Once again, yes. Yeah, so, so the order's clear. It says that you can't force them to do any of it. Um, my whole thing is that I think in that situation that the order would apply to both, both parties, the buyer and seller that are dealing with it. The buyer couldn't force you, the seller couldn't force you. So probably, you know, if the AG had, was sitting here on the call with us, he'd want you to end up doing some type of extension, um, even though it's already in contract to close. Now, again, I'll have to point out the fact that someone would have to report you, right? You'd have to have an upset tenant that says, Andrew forced me to go through showing my property. Um, they would have to report that to the AG's office and say that you're in violation of uh, the governor's executive order. I can't guarantee that a tenant would or wouldn't do that. And I'm not telling you to go forward with doing it. I'm just telling you that's how it would have to happen. And so I know of a couple of tenants right now in properties that I have that they're looking forward to moving. They want to move, they want to get it done. And I know they're not going to complain about it, but again, um, you have to try to do everything you can to follow the order. So I would first try to seek an extension. And as these issues come up, you know, we're planning on throwing them back at the AG and say, so what do you want us to do now? Because uh, these could all end up being small litigations between a buyer and a seller over the fact they were expensing costs to be able to move. And I don't have a good answer for you on what we're going to do in that instance yet. It's a, it changes literally every day when I open my email. Okay, Tanya is back. Um, so going on Andrew's question, let's say that they decided they were going to go ahead and move forward with that and the tenant's totally cool with it or whatever. And then the tenant gets upset later and decides to go report it. What is the consequence at that point? Is, this, is there a fine or is this just something where if the governor gets more complaints, he's just gonna shut us down completely? So um, just this last, um, just two days ago, I think the city of North Las Vegas, it could have just been yesterday, voted uh, to uh, impose penalties, um, starting with a thousand dollar fine uh, for violating the governor's executive order on any level. And it could go up to jail time. Um, the whole thing is, you know, city of Las Vegas, unincorporated Clark, Clark County, some of the other municipalities have not put in such restrictions or, or issues. It's an enforcement problem right now for the state. They're, they don't have people to enforce if we were to have 20 or 30 issues. Um, but, you know, everyone is looking at it pretty strict. Um, the constable's office, you know, could be called out to protect that tenant. They could call the police and say, hey, I told them I didn't want someone in my house. Um, all those things could happen and it could come back to you as the agent where you could receive a, a fine. We saw the same thing, I don't know, five or six years ago with um, asset managers where literally they didn't care what the law said. And so they imposed, what was it, Todd, a $50,000 fine and jail time. 
if the asset manager was uh, violating, um, you know, the state law. So I think something like that could happen. And the worst thing that could happen to our industry is that we start to have a lot of these issues, which, you know, just looking at the writing on the wall, we will, um, because if that happens and it gets back to the AG, they'll just shut us down completely. Okay, thank you. Got a question from Brandy. Brandy? Brandy Thompson? Hey, there I, sorry, I was muted here too. Um, I have a property in contract that's tenant occupied, but the tenant is also the buyer. Am mm -hmm. I gonna have a problem getting the appraisal done? Wow, that's a, that's a great spin on that scenario. Um, I guess the tenant would have to report himself, right? And you, I, I think in that instance, because he is the buyer, again, um, he couldn't force himself to come in and do his own inspection, I guess is kind of the ironic part about it. Um, it just sounds like he probably wouldn't report it, but yeah, it still follows the same, same section. So technically shouldn't be doing it, but <laughs> I mean, obviously he's not going to report himself. So Okay. And I can't like sit here and say break the law uh, because it's now the law. And even though state law says, you know, that was the biggest argument. Well, state law says all I have to do is give 24 hours notice. An executive order trumps state law. So that's that's the thing to think of. But I just don't see a scenario where he's going to report himself. Uh, no. How, if he doesn't act because he's the tenant, I don't see a scenario where the seller could enforce it. That's another okay. side of that coin. So. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Chris, is there is this a time we should be putting some kind of paperwork together that we could you know in, in and resistance or now Brandy's uh, where a seller and a buyer and a tenant may collectively decide they're going to try to hide under the bushes and do what they do? Is there, is there some type of disclosure we should be putting together in order to inform everybody of what? executive order is get it signed uh, you know i mean i'm not, not saying that's going to protect us from a thousand dollars or jail time but it would be some protection i think what i think what you can do is one of two things number one the COVID 19 addendum kind of looks at the overarching force majeure policy that you know this is an act of god and we don't control what happens well part of those acts are these executive orders that are put in place for the protection of the the people that it's affecting i think that you could use that document and it's an additional terms explain to a buyer or seller why we have to do this extension. Um, you could also take that section of the order, which you'll get section six, and you could take the wording in section six and say, based on this order that was presented by the governor today on 4, April 9th, um, we are no longer allowed to access the property uh, for the state's protection of the tenant. Buyer or seller requests an extension of close of escrow. I mean, you could put the wording into it because it would actually show that this is real, it's, it's not a joke. The order itself, I mean, it looks like a birth certificate type official document. It's four pages. You could take that order, print it out, and attach it to any document that you're creating to show this is real. It, it wasn't something I made up. And I think that everyone is in the same boat, right? I mean, it's not like we're the only ones dealing with it. Every single agent out in the marketplace, every single buyer or seller is bound by these restrictions because it's the law. And so I think that you could use it for information and Hopefully, you know, if you present enough information to somebody, um, their understanding of it, but we all know how buyers and sellers are. So it, it will be an uphill battle for every one of us. All right. I asked for Jay, but it's Jay's iPhone. Oh, hey. Uh, sorry about that. I had to unmute it. Um, question for you. I don't know if you guys saw the news last night, um, Channel 3 News, where they're reporting uh, about Tom Blatchard. He was on the news. And he did not say this, and I'm sure he told uh, Steve, I think it's Steve Wolford from Channel 3 News, but he goes, and he should not have said this, I believe, on the news is a drop in prices up to 35%. All that did, I believe, was scare the heck out of everyone, buyers, sellers, everyone included. Why would he do something like that? I mean, that's, to me, is crazy. Should have, He could have left it alone, prices could drop but they didn't have to say up to 35%. Who's going to buy right now? If they, if the people had heard that is what I'm saying. Yeah, Jay, I'll tell you, I've known Tom Blanchard for 10 years and uh, Janet and I have served on the board with him. And if there's one thing that no one should say during a meeting, Tom will be the first person to say it. Um, so as Brandon knows him as well. And um, you know, 
it's a difficult position for anyone to be put in to do these interviews. I have six interviews set up for today and every reporter that I'm going to talk to is going to try and coerce me to say something bad about the governor or say something bad about the order or say something bad about my fellow agents or given, you know, when is this all going to end? I got asked that twice last week. Um, I have no idea. If I knew that I wouldn't be sitting here. I, you know, I'd be the governor. And I think the whole idea is that, um, people say stupid things when they're asked questions that they're not prepared for. And I think that, you know, what I would do is get as much information as possible. These reports and, and uh, FAQs that were just put out are for that one purpose of providing consistent, concise information. And I think that Tom's issue is that he, uh, he reacts to things more than plans for things. And I love the guy. He's doing as much as he can and he's trying to keep everyone informed, but um, every once in a while, someone makes a mistake. I'll tell you, I, I got an uh, interview last night with Eli Siegel, and uh, he was a reporter for the uh, RJ, does all the real estate sections, and he called me immediately, like five minutes after the governor stopped, he called me and said, so what does this mean for showings? And I said, well, it doesn't apply to owner-occupied properties. Well, what do you mean it doesn't apply to owner-occupied properties? I said, it only applies to tenant-occupied. Well, he said owner-occupied. I said that are occupied by tenants. And of course, in his article, he reported no showings on occupied properties. Even though I told him, even though I provided him the order before anyone else did, he still reported it that way. And so of course, um, I've asked him to issue a retraction because it's not correct. And he wants to fight me on that. So, you know, sometimes the media just wants to spin it to sell uh, papers or to get viewership. And I think the one thing we have to be prepared for as agents is to have the facts. And so I probably, you know, I wouldn't say laminate it, but I would have that order. I would have the COVID-19 risk mitigation practices available at any time for a client. And I would have all the information that you see out there that you know to be incorrect or correct at your disposal so that you can dispute um, bad facts with good facts. And I think that's, you know, the primary job of an agent is to be the source of the source and provide good information to a client who heard on the news 35%. Well, wait a minute, yesterday Tom reported that the market price increased by $4,000 to 319, the highest price ever. So, you know, it would stand to reason if the sales drop and everything else, we would see a correction, but I don't know where he comes up with 35%. Well, in, in, if you guys don't know, I mean, Chris is the president of the state association, which is a great asset for us. Um, because when this order came out from the governor yesterday, I immediately saw misinformation going all over Facebook and people text me misinformation. If you guys have questions, Chris is probably the best source to go to directly um, before you start spreading things or putting things out there that may be not true. So let's make sure we have our facts straight when we do it, so. Yeah, and that's, that, that was my concern. It's not, I wasn't blaming Tom Blanchard at all. He may sure. have said to Steve Wolford, hey, up to 30, the, the news shouldn't, and what I'm saying is the news should not have said that. And. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. It's a, it, that, that probably, whoever saw that scared the crap out of everyone, whoever saw it. Yeah. I think. So anyway, yeah, that was my question. So, you know, Janet serves on the, on the local board still as the past president. Um, and, you know, I talked with Janet last night and, and of course, you know, even the board members, um, you know, sometimes put out information that technically isn't correct. I just learned a long time ago that, you know, immediate reactions are always the best. So it's better to get your facts together before you put something out versus putting out something just to do it. And I think that, uh, I think it's a better step. You know, I, a lot of your clients are now wondering, what does this mean for me? Even clients that haven't listed their home yet, or that Thanks. maybe, they don't know. Thank you guys. Thank Thanks, you, Jay. Anyone else? How about any other issues going on out there? I think the only thing that, um, that I, I really am concerned about, and I, I, I know that we're going to see it, um, literally, uh, we're one step away from being non-essential. And so it's one thing to keep our industry open and progressing and uh, all of us here. So I think the, the example is that you know, the agents we have at Signature are amazing agents that do great business and um, they take good care of each other. And I, I think that if you see agents out there doing things they shouldn't be doing, you know, unfortunately it's the time to report them because the more that we can get them in line and uh, keep things moving in a positive direction, we could survive this without you know, any further issue. The good news is right now we have a good communication chain with the governor and the AG's office. 
Um, anytime something comes up related to our industry, our lobbying team jumps right on it. And so I think that, you know, the more positivity that we're putting out there, that things are working, that, you know, that we're working within these guidelines. That's why my message was like, it wasn't, oh crap, I can't believe you did this to us. It was absolutely, we support you governor and we'll do what we can to make our industry conform to it. That's the only way to craft that message. And so I think that as you uh, get comments from people, uh, keep it extremely positive. To Jay's point, you know, the sky isn't falling. This too will pass. Um, in every issue, there's opportunity. And I think that, you know, we'll get past it. We have to. That's all I got to say. Andrew, Chris, Chris was there any conversations with anybody uh, about when the governor thought that he would lift anything? Is it April 30th? Or is it going to go into May? Is there any other thought? I'll be honest with you. He's avoided that question. Every time it's been asked of him, he won't speculate. And I think that he doesn't know. I think that from what I've heard from our lobbying group, um, because you know they, they lobby for different organizations that have been forcing that question, um, right now he's set for April 30th. And I think that he's given himself the flexibility because he hasn't committed to anything, uh, that if he has to extend it, he can. Everything that I see um, you know, shows kind of a positive trend right now. Um, but he has not come out and said, we've hit the peak of, you know, the flattening of this curve. And so I think that um, we'll know in the next probably 10 days if there's going to be an extension. If you've noticed, he's always done it about 10 days before uh, the next one comes up, about 14 days on the last one. So I think every two weeks is kind of that benchmark. So by the 15th or 16th, we'll know if we're going to be extended into May. I don't know. This is just me interpreting something I saw in the marketplace, but I think it's kind of interesting that some of the hotels have extended their furlough pay into May, not knowing yet if there's going to be an extension or not. I've never seen a company agree to, f to pay a furlough outside of when they'd be open for business. So I don't know if that's a sign of someone knowing something we don't, but I just saw today, was it MGM or one of them extended to May 15th or maybe it was stations, I don't remember, but it just kind of seems strange in my brain, but maybe it's just them being proactive. Well, I Adelson did it about a week ago, said he'd paid to the middle of May to all of his employees. Um, and, I, and I think, they're, I think what, the, what they're thinking is there's gonna be a 15 to 20, 25 day lag between we're open for business and we're busy kind of thing. I think it's gonna take 30 days. So I. I don't feel like casinos are going to pull all of their employees back in on day one. Uh, I think they'll, they'll span, span it out over two to three weeks. So I, I think that's kind of what they're thinking. Yeah, I think you're right. It's going to take a, a while before tourism comes back. I know people have been cooped up a long time. Might be the hottest month Vegas. ever. <laughs> so. Anyone Any else? Any broker questions or interesting situations they just got themselves into? Yeah, I know we have a lot of issues to work out. By the way, with all of you, with, with anything that comes from this, um, all of the brokers are here to support you. We'll help you think through it. Um, you know, as the transaction issues come up, let us know. We'll try to get some legal counsel and, and see what we can work out. The AG's been pretty uh, good at communicating, um, but we'll help you through whatever transaction fixes this puts you in. I mean, that's what we're here for. Yeah, so Chris, is interesting stuff. Yeah, Robert. Chris, get, give me your opinion on a transaction that just doesn't close. Buyer and seller can't agree to extend, yeah. just doesn't close because the buyer doesn't perform, uh, whether they can't because of a loan or whether they're a cash guy and they think the market's crashing by 35% because Tom doesn't know when to zip it up. Whatever, whatever that looks like. What, what do you think, you know, what's the down, what's going to happen to the people that just don't close? I, I think the problem is um, usually in those type of situations, I mean, we've had a number of earnest money disputes right now. And, and what most people don't know is they get so upset right when the transaction initially breaks up and it's the point of it and it's the principle and I'm going to get that money and I'm going to fight for it. And then when they find out that it's going to cost them a few thousand dollars to fight for a few thousand dollars, everyone's attitude changes, right? And so I think that if you're in a transaction and you're having issues, number one, get communication going as fast as possible. Um, bring in broker support. You know, 
sometimes if the agent just doesn't understand the order or what's going on because they haven't been in the business very long or they've been in the business 30 years and they've been doing it wrong for 29 and a half of them. I mean, I've seen that as well. It's just get the communication started. I think that you should go to everyone with a plan. Hey guys, I was just on a call with my brokerage. We found out that this order came out. We have a, a tenant in this property. We can't force them to show or access or anything else. If they give us any kickback or any issues, we should be prepared right now for an extension. Let's extend 30 days. Um, where we can get this property sold and get you where you need to go and all that good stuff. I think that making sure the lender um, knows what's going on and you're communicating with them, your escrow officer, because it's that one person in the chain that didn't get the email. <coughs> and I think that the more communication you can do, the better off you'll be. And just try to extend and work it out. It's better than a cancellation. When you cancel, everyone suffers. And at the end of the day, if a property cannot be sold just because no one's willing to work with it, you may have to cancel and move on to something else. Robert, what's going on? You got your hand up. I mean, I was just uh, going to ask a question on what would you guys recommend? It's funny. I threw it away, but I got a letter. I'm um, in the mail from this idiot realtor saying he actually said that you have equity in your house. Sell now while you still can. So obviously we can't say those things and those verbiages, but what would you recommend for people that are still like calling on Mojo? Like, what can we say to people when they, they're asking the main question is, geez, you know, is it a good time to sell now? Is it going to go down? Like, what, what would you say for prospecting every day? I think, and I'll let uh, Todd and Brandon give their opinion, but I think that, you know, saying something that you don't know to be true or you can't prove puts you in a bad position as a salesperson. But I still know that people have a lot of equity, right? And I know that right now people are out of work. I know that people have credit card bills and things that are mounting up because they're living off of it. And I know that a lot of people, because we spent the last six, seven years with 60% of the homes being paid for cash, have a huge amount of equity. And so I, don't, I think the only thing you have to say on the phone is, hey, um, I'm here to help you out in any way I can. I know that a lot of people right now have equity in their home. Do you know how much equity you have right now? And would that be something important for you to get out of the house and put into your bank account? And I think that's the, the motivation that they would have. I think that it's the you know, pain of, of uncertainty to look at your bank account and think, wow, I don't have a paycheck coming in. I don't know when it's going to start coming in. I know that I have to feed my kids and pay my bills. And the only thing I have is this house that I put everything into. I mean, that's pretty motivating without me saying some stupid, you know, sign that, oh my God, the sky is falling. Get your money out of your house while you can. What if the market goes up 25% because inventory is low? I mean, I don't, that could happen. It could absolutely happen. Um, but it's just a question of, you know, is it probable to happen? I think just try to do everything as much virtual as you can. It, exactly. I think the market will have a correction. I think it needed a correction. Let's all be honest. We're approaching crazy levels in a crazy market. But inventory is still, I mean, with we're only going to have 2,000 owner-occupied properties, 2,600 vacant homes. That's 4,600 homes. That's the lowest inventory we've had in I don't know how long. So that has an effect, too. Todd, what do you think, Brandon? Janet? I, I don't want to say, I, I personally, I think the market's going to go up. As soon as this thing ends, I think we're going to see, well, I don't think any of us, any of us are ready for the storm of buyers and sellers when this thing ends. We're not, we don't have systems in place to help cover that. Um, I, I just, so, I, that's my opinion though. There are no facts for that. Sorry, Janet. No, I stepped on you. I'm sorry, Todd. No, I have no crystal ball, but it just seems to me people always have to move. They always have to buy or sell. And with a total lack of inventory, I know one agent I talked to last night, he has he had just had his fourth escrow canceled because they couldn't verify income past April 15th. But he has worked so hard for them and been so upfront with them that all four of them are waiting. And as soon as they go back to work, all four of them are buying a house. And so I think we're going to have a real shortage of inventory, which could possibly drive up prices. So, and I, sorry, Brandon, let me just real quick. I think everyone needs to prepare, prepare their clients and in your consult, you need to be telling them about how to handle a multiple offer situation because when we get there, when this thing opens back up, I can't foresee any way there aren't going to be multiple offers on every single property that you put an offering on. Sorry, Brandon. 
No, no worries. So my concern always was with the market was how long this thing goes. And if this thing goes month after month, then I think you you might see some people get in some trouble. But um, it seems to be uh, less people are getting admitted to the hospital across the country. And if everyone follows the social distancing, I don't think this thing's going to go too much longer, which would lead me to believe that Todd and them are exactly right. Um, we're going to get back to it and people are going to be anxious to get back to it and, and, and purchase homes, sell their homes. So um, be prepared. Uh, this is a good time for you guys to put your systems in place so you're there. If you don't know how to work multiple offers, this is a good time to get with one of the brokers so that you're ready for it when it happens. Um, but have your systems ready because the people that are working now, still staying in touch with people are the ones that are going to come out of this the fastest. If you're taking your time off, um, which it's okay if you want to do that, it's going to be a little tougher for you to get, get moving at, at, when it starts again. So I would say stay in contact with people. Don't disengage. I think the other thing is um, all of us need to be prepared for a new norm. Um, life will not go back to the way it was before ever again. I, I was at uh, Starbucks today because um, that's my only quick outing. I'm allowed to walk down the street to there and get it. And the lady at Starbucks had her face mask on and she goes, wow, you know, I think I could get used to wearing this just because you never know. And I think that that new normalcy of what we see as normal, you see people driving around in their car with their face masks on, but they're the only ones in their car, right? You know, it's just the, the mentality of what we'll actually see, just like this. I mean, 52 people are here engaging together to get information. Many brokers never thought that agent involvement would happen like this. I mean, I could see getting my buyer uh, on a Zoom call, showing them properties on Zoom because I can share my screen instead of bringing them into my office and sitting in my conference room. I never would have thought of that before and now it seems like the new normal that even my buyer is prepared for me to ask them to do. And so I think that we all need to pre be prepared for that as well. And, and regardless of the market, no matter what happens, whether the market goes up or the market goes down, 30 to 40,000 homes are gonna sell. That's just a fact regardless in the last 20 years. And so I think we, uh, we just need to get our share of it. Right. And you, you, the technology you're using today can make your, your business a lot uh, easier moving forward. So I think it's, uh, there, there's some bright sides that will come out of this. Um, hey guys, it's Fasta. Hey, welcome. Hi, thanks. Um, going back to your question, Robert, on what you guys can still say, you can actually get lists right from title companies even now that say there is um, equity in certain homes and you can specifically ask for those properties if that's the clientele that you want to reach out to, to pull those lists. Yeah, and I think Todd said something the other day on one of our calls um, you can't really speak to what the future will hold, but you can speak yeah. to what's happening right now. Correct. And if you know your if you know your stats and how many homes are on the market and all that kind of stuff, you can speak to all that stuff. And I also liked what Todd said. It might have been last week when he said keep in touch with your sphere. Don't call and ask them if they need to buy or sell, but call and ask, how are they doing? And is there anything I can connect you with in the community that will help you? Just ask those kind of things and keep in touch with them. And then you'll be foremost in their mind when they get ready to do something. I got a message yesterday from Chris Patrick saying he was going to Walmart and wanted to buy me something. <laughs> yeah, I got one of those the day before. <laughs> Or yeah, the day before. Anything like that is wonderful. I didn't get a message. I just like to point that out for people's <laughs> reference. I'm a little hurt right now too. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm, I'm gonna leave the meeting. I didn't get a contact either. I got I got two messages. He was going to Walmart twice for me. I'm muting you. <laughs> you guys aren't in my sphere of influence. <laughs> I can't for email attitude. I, I, I can tell you if you want good supplies, just go to Pahrump. I was there yesterday finishing the closing, and uh, my kids have been wanting pasta forever, and they had actual pasta on the shelves. You know uh, what's interesting, too? I went to a butcher shop. Um, I couldn't get into Costco, and uh, I don't think I've been to a butcher shop in, I don't, ever. I don't even think I've used that term ever, but there's one that's down the street from me, and it was fantastic. I mean, 
Um, they didn't have a lot of people, but you could tell they've been busy all day. They're open um, seven days a week because they're a normal, they have a little bit of a markup, but it was amazing. I, best steaks I've ever bought. But a lot of, you know, no one would ever thought that would be something that. Chris, I, Chris Patrick, I hope, I hope to get into your sphere of influence. That would just mean I own a home that's super expensive and really nice. So <laughs> obviously Wanda and Janet own those things. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get there, man. I'll, I'll let you know when I'm there. <laughs> Not to totally like give away your trade secrets, Chris, but the last one you did like brought tears to my eyes too about the old man who was getting soup. Like I was just like, wow, that, that like touched in a different way. It was, you could like feel it and you, you like, like you were there. You know what I mean? It was a great message. So we get it, Bonnet, and we that. get it. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> You're part of his sphere. He <laughs> just keeps twisting that knife, doesn't she? I'm not trying. <laughs> I'm giving him props. I think it's great. I think people can learn from, from what he's doing. He's doing a great job. Yeah, I agree. He's, he's, he's doing it. I mean, he's doing what we're saying to do. Go yep. talk to his fear. Stay in touch. Yep. Send out those little, those little feely, touchy things that people uh, have time to look at right now and they'll, they'll relate to. Every time I've, re I've made a touch to any of my contacts or my sphere of influence, I haven't mentioned one thing about real estate. I noticed that. Not one thing. And, you know, I've gotten more responses and more opens and more re return emails from those emails than I ever had about anything to do with real estate at all. So just like Janet said, hi, Janet. Just like you said, the people that you're touching now are going to remember you when this is all over as being someone that actually cared about them and wasn't just trying to sell their house. So, so here would be the challenge to continue that after this. Um, because if you become that that realtor, right. I think you're, you're going to be their go-to person. So for everything, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what they're looking for. I mean, Chris is able to venture to freaking Walmart for God's sake. Not well, a lot of people can say that. Well, <laughs> read, and I'm read, reading the chat. Aaron says he hasn't been there in seven years. So. I know. I just saw that. <laughs> But he's willing to go. That's that's the important part. What if I said, "Yeah, I need some toilet paper." I think he would have gone to go get it. I will go. So, I will. See, I know it might not be Walmart. You might pretend it is, but like it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> so I did talk about Chris. I didn't mention his name last night on the uh, WCR Zoom call, and um, I talked about Chris reaching out, and I I remember saying. And he said he was going to Walmart. If I needed anything, he'd be happy to pick it up and drop it off for me. And then I corrected myself and I said, oh, wait a minute, maybe he said Target because he's kind of an upscale guy. Maybe it was Target instead of Walmart. <laughs> uh, I'll still, I'll go to Walmart for you, Janet. Oh, thank you, Chris. That's why when I decide to sell my house, I'm calling you because you kept in touch with me during all this. See? 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 Yep. She's just trying to stay on your list. Uh, trying to you stay guys on have your opted out. You guys probably opted out of my emails. That's why I'm not getting them anymore. No, I just don't read them. <laughs> just like the newsletter, dang it. I'm going to start, though. Well, once you've got this uploaded, let me know and I'll stick it in the newsletter and we'll, it'll be ready to go. So yeah, the, um, the newsletter is set to go out at uh, 1030. It's gone. Oh, okay. So, but we will post this. We will also post this in the agents of signature so you guys can go back to it. Um, if you have anything that, uh, from the beginning that Chris was talking about. But you can always reach out to us too. That's what we're here for. And um, we're just only as you at times. So please give us a call, text, email, show up to these, these virtual office deals. These are, these are fun and it's a good time to connect too. And if anyone else has anything that's working out there, I'd welcome you to share it. First time caller, long time listener. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, actually, the newsletter hasn't gone out. It'll go out at 11. Oh, hey, will, you, will you hold it? 
you just hold off. I'm going to give Vonda the link to this so that she can add it to the newsletter. She'll tell you when to send it, Ashley. I just wanted to point out, Janet, you uh, mentioned something the other day about the MLS fees, and I don't know that I want to make sure everyone, at least on this, um, knows that they did offer an extension. Of course, many of us already paid our MLS fees. Um, they offered an extension. Is it till the end of April, Janet? Yeah, your MLS fees have been extended with no penalty. You have to pay by May 1st. Now, we've also had some other issues that we're going to deal with in the next board meeting because there have been quite a number of agents once they found out, brand new agents, once they found out that um, the MLS fees were extended, they've been asking for breaks on their uh, joining the association fees, which right now in the month of April are like $1,700. The board hasn't decided that, but if we have a major drop in membership, uh, we could be in a world of hurt. But just so you know, talking about the governor's order, the MLS is supposed to have, I don't know if they've done it yet because I haven't checked, put up an unbranded tour link for open houses. So you can still go in and register open houses and put them on a virtual tour in the MLS. Just so you know that that should have already been done, but I haven't checked it. It, it is has on. been. And the other okay. thing that is important to point out is that there are gonna be no free rides out of this. Everyone that's getting deferrals on payments for rent I just convened a, a pad for the state association because we're going to have a tremendous amount of tenants that are going to have one to two months in back rent that is going to come due when this is all lifted. And so I think the word to everyone that you're talking to, even to the homeowners that, you know, are looking at not making their payment because they're out of work or whatever it is, do anything you can to make payment arrangements with any of those servicers or any relief that you get, because what a lot of people do, we saw it 10 years ago when they get relief, they take that money and spend it on personal things that may or may not be the item that was being relieved, and then they're out of the money. And so there's going to be a big issue that we will have to overcome, no matter how this works out, no matter if it's lifted in uh, April 30th or not, but we're going to have a, a ton of tenants that literally have not paid their rent for two months um, that need to get that worked out. So. I think that that's another message that you can share with your clients. Hey, just because they're saying they're going to help you out, don't not do anything and have this big bill come due. Same thing with your dues. And right after the MLS fees are done, key fees come due. And it's better to you know make small chips away at it than to have to come up with the whole thing. So don't look at it as free anything. I saw that got the excitement going. Well, it, it actually reminds me back in the short sale days when, when you'd be doing a short sale for a seller and they would spend their house payment every month because they weren't paying the bank. They'd spend it on something else. People would come up with the weirdest new boats, new RVs, new four wheelers because they weren't paying their house payments. And then when it got down to the end and they needed to put a $2,000 contribution in to make it happen, they didn't have any cash. So yeah, same, same scenario. Just people, you got to keep paying what you got to pay if you can and then figure out if you can't you gotta figure out how to make a plan yeah absolutely can you guys hear me yeah. yeah um i don't know if i read this right but it stated that we have to um offer someone a payment plan and give them up to 30 days to pay it before we can even start an eviction did i read that right yeah you did um, it's not it's not a mandatory requirement um it is um what was the exact language it was uh, encouraged best practice yeah so, so it was something like that it was we encourage you to work out a payment plan but it, there, it's not mandatory at all whatsoever to do it um and you are supposed to do it 30 days after if you are going to do it within 30 days okay so after this has all been lifted so if I put a tenant on a payment plan, they don't make their first payment, mm -hmm. I then can start the seven day. So there's a, I'm still going back. I'm on, I'm on a PAG. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm on a PAG with the Nevada Association and 
the way that it, the way that they're saying it now is let's just say it's a thousand dollar rent every single month. They didn't pay April and they didn't pay May. Right. And so you decide and the tenant and the landlord all agree that it's a $200 a month extra payment every single month. So now they've increased that for the next year, or however long it takes to, to, you know, get them up to, um, up to date to pay off April and May. If they pay their thousand dollars in June, but that not their two hundred dollars, right? Because now you've changed the lease agreement. You've done an addendum, and it is their their payments have changed to twelve hundred dollars a month. So now that's an actual. It's twelve hundred dollars. You no longer take partial payments. When we spoke to the judge um, to Saragossa, she said you would never be able to do late payments on that two hundred dollars because it was part of the April and May. I disagree because now there's a new lease in place. I have another, we have another call in, in a week and a half where I'll have that discussion with her um, because I think that once you have an addendum and you've created a, a new lease, they're new lease, lease terms essentially. So if they don't pay the 200, they're paying partial rent, which we don't accept. And you can evict them based off of that. You would, or she said for now, you can do a five day lease violation of the addendum and then an unlawful, unlawful detainer, so on and so forth. But the only problem with that is that <coughs> there's no backlog in the eviction courts that even if you filed it, you may not be able to get the eviction because there's right. no one to hear. It. So they've got three, they've got two new hearing masters, so a total of three um, that they hired before we all went into um, uh, hearing this master, thing. That's really the name? Yeah, they're called hearing masters and they handle all the evictions. And so I'm when we come that. out of this, there will be three on board who are who have been watching all the jags so far jabs jabs so that they know how to handle eviction essentially eviction court because it's a whole different ball game for now if there is a complaint um, for summary eviction it'll be reviewed and processed as usual if it falls under the exception from the governor's directive that is the one that says i took a lot of really good notes um, persons who cause significant damage to property, danger to public, um, and danger to others. They, if they are, if, because that's the exception, right? So if they fall in that category, they'll treat that eviction as usual today, is from what she was saying. So they're doing, they're doing, I guess, court from online or some, some stuff based off of this. Now there are other um, municipalities, and I don't know, did you guys talk about Clark County in North Las Vegas already? that are fining, they are now oh. fining people for um, putting up notices uh, to vacate. So I'm, I, it will be in the newsletter, Shell. So make sure you read the newsletter. It has, all, it has the actual, um, uh, what did I put in there? I put the actual notice, the press release from city of North Las Vegas regarding those fines and who it'll affect. Um, because it is a thousand dollar fine and Clark County is doing the same thing. It's essentially because everybody has a stay at home order. I don't know if that's exactly what it's called, but it's a, a shelter in place directive, right? So because yeah. of that, you can't force any, you can say, hey, you've got your lease is up. You got to move. We're not going to be renewing, but they don't have to move during right. this time because of the shelter in place directive. Right. I have, I have one owner that is wants to give notice and we've had to put that on hold. We've also put all um, annual like evaluations on hold as well. Right. So just remember on notices though for non-renewals, you can do those right online. You can do those through an addendum. You just can't post them. That's what the fine is saying. You can't post them, but you can give them notice. If they don't want to leave during this time, they don't have to. So yeah. just prepare your landlords for that. Okay. Yeah. And that's, it's going to affect uh, buying and selling the most, I think, right? It's going to be the tenant property, tenant occupied properties um, where they're in contract, property's about to sell, they were supposed to move at the end of the month. I think that's where we're going to see a lot of the, the issues come up. You know, that, that makes a valid question uh, to Chris's point. Is Chris still on here? Chris, you still there? Yeah, you're still there. So if you have that deal where they're not allowing access because the tenant's going to stay in it, but you have a buyer and seller that are still transacting the deal and they want to close, you could, in some cases, as long as it's not FHA where they have to occupy you know, 30 days, you could create an addendum that says buyer and seller agree to close escrow, uh, lean back 
$2,000 in escrow to deal with any property condition. I mean, there's a number of workarounds that you could do that would not have you granting access, but could still complete a deal with buyer and seller as long as the appraisal was already done. And I got to believe that with everything that's being affected, that there are going to be appraisers that are going to have to do exterior appraisals on a tenant occupied property. Um, it'll happen. I mean, it happened 10 years ago. I think it could happen again because of the circumstances. I don't know if it'll happen right away, but I mean, that would be an easy workaround and you just have to have a, you know, I create a pretty big addendum that has a lot of what ifs um, and a lot of protection for both buyer and seller, but that would be a way to get the deal closed um, and, and progress forward in a way. I mean, the other thing you could do is see if the appraiser would accept video, if you could get the tenant to give it to you of the property, you know, like literally walking through it and this is the house. I mean, I've got to expect that they're as affected as we are and, and we can definitely, I'll make a note to reach out to the appraisal commission and see, you know, if there's some workarounds there because it'll affect everybody. So Misty, there is no, I'm going to actually two points, Chris, one to your appraisal thing. Um, again, because of, because of what's happening, it's really important that you talk to the lender um, during this time. If there is a tenant in the property or if the seller is not willing to show the property and doesn't want anybody in there, tell um, the lender immediately because then they can find an appraiser that will do the drive-bys versus mm -hmm having to go inside because that otherwise your deal will not move forward. Right. Um, and then the other thing to Misty's point, she asked if there was a waiver form for a tenant, if they're willing to show there is not, not at this time, nor do we, and I don't think we intend to have one. Um, but there is a form where tenants can fill out for you to have um, showings allowed uh, with lock boxes. Do we still have that form in transaction desk? Does anybody know? Yeah, the tenant authorization form to put a box yeah. on. Yeah. But I yeah. think that's, I think with the governor's order though, that, that goes out the window. It does. Uh, you shouldn't even, you shouldn't even be asking him to do showings because they could say they were coerced into it. So you don't want to be the example set by the attorney general's office. Well, and coming into the next legislative session, you definitely don't want to be the example because it will hurt our businesses in the future. So I'm just, um, um, I have some concern about even, we haven't accepted this off yet. We're about to, but I have some concern about accepting it because then we can't even let the buyer in to look at it, nor can we let an inspector in to inspect it. And, you know, theoretically it could be extended out until this thing ends. And now I'm putting my guy in a situation where, like, like God was saying, if values go up, now we're locked into this deal at X price when we could have just waited, get the tenant out of there at the end of May, and then maybe values go up, you know? So I'm, I'm hesitant to even accept but this it, offer. But you, 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 go ahead. You explain that, you explain the pros and cons to your seller and let them make that decision. Exactly. Um, you, you, you don't have a crystal ball. Prices could go down too. And right. so you just don't know. So I think your point, the point is, Chris, just like you said, Mr. Seller, here are your two options. We can go down this road and I can create this big addendum that talks about all the things that we're not going to be able to do with this buyer based on the offer they wrote. You're going to have to have a big conversation with the buyer's agent to explain, listen, I can't make the tenant do any of these things. This just happened last night. Thank God it happened before we accepted your offer because now I can address it in the offer. And I mean, I literally would address every occupancy contingency that means they get access and say, this will not be allowed. You'll have to, you know, figure out something else. And Mr. Seller, if you decide to go down this road, we can sell your home and put it in the contract and work with this buyer. And you will have to work with this buyer over everything, or we can take your home off the market, hold it for, you know, 21 days and see if this is all lifted and then find out what the market's like then. I mean, what would you like to do? And I think that that's the whole point is it's going to be the seller deciding, well, you know, I really just want to know my home is sold or, you know, I think you're absolutely right, Chris, let's wait and see what happens. But I would also document that in writing because the worst thing in the world is that, you know, the seller comes back with amnesia later and says, well, I never wanted to take my home off the market. Chris told me to do it. You know, I think that you want to protect yourself. And by the way, in Skyslope, you should have all of those emails with your file documenting those communications it's really easy. You can just forward the email. Can I ask a question? 
no yeah. we're done. <laughs> Um, so obviously with this, this whole, um, what you talked about, Chris, and the stay at home mandate and everything and, and people reporting, um, you know, open houses and things like that, that we're obviously in jeopardy now of losing our, you know, our right to being a non or an essential business at this point. Um, is there something that as leadership you guys can do maybe to implore to the brokers, um, to, you know, get it out there, that message to, to all of our agents that, Hey, we guys really, you know, we really have to start abiding by these rules because we're all in jeopardy of losing this and maybe through social media means or i don't know if it's local council meetings or you know mvar lvar lvr excuse me um is there something that we can do maybe collectively even as agents uh as an effort to to try to get that out there that hey we guys you know we got to stop doing this because we're going to lose our ability to sell homes and our livelihoods i think that you know unfortunately we have fifteen thousand members and um you know, just in Las Vegas and 18,000 in the state. And I think that we are all doing everything within our power to get the message out there. But just like you see on Facebook, I mean, I could post a hundred times, I could send out a hundred emails, I could text everybody, and there's still gonna be 30 people that act like they never knew anything about it and they're doing business as usual, right? Yeah. And I, I think it's up to us individually to see something, say something, um, you know, as you <laughs> You're transacting your business and you see something going on, say something about it. Hey, listen, you know, do you not understand how that could affect us? Um, please be considerate of other agents. And I think that's all we can do. Um, but, you know, every time we've gone down this road, I, I'm more in trying to extend the inevitable than trying to, you know, fix it because I know just with what happened in North Las Vegas, what you guys were talking about, mm -hmm. a few property managers posting notice when they shouldn't have been is what caused the AG to get upset about something he told the governor and the governor even misstated it in his announcement. He literally said no showings on anything, uh, which was not even the order that we agreed to. And so that just leads me to believe he's thinking about it, just like Tom mentioned. And so I think that, you know, it'll be not a question of when, but how long until then. And I think that, you know, Janet can tell you that uh, those board members that are on there, who you elect matters and what they say matters. And I think that the common theme for all of us is keep it positive and you know, keep it progressing. I know I just saw a comment from Misty on here. Is there a waiver for the tenant to be okay with showings? No, you can't even ask them to be okay with showings. So there's no waiver, there's no document, there's no, um, that lockbox document that Brandon and V were talking about. I wouldn't even go down that road of putting a box on it because the AG has said that you can't do anything with that. None, zilch, zero. Well, I don't, and I don't know if Misty's asking, is it okay if the tenant if the ten tenant's willing to do it. I haven't even asked. Yeah, what if the tenant's willing to do it? You can't even go down the road. The, governor said no. the only thing that I've said the whole time is that, you know, someone would have to report it. And you don't want to be the example as Brandon pointed out. So if you have a tenant that's already gone along with the showings and everything, as soon as they find out they don't have to do something, you can't, yeah. can't do anything to them for it. But someone would have to know. Londona. Yeah. So it's Clark County and you said it's shelter in place. Is that what you're saying? The, you yeah, I can actually, so the directive will be, um, no, the shelter in place is what the governor has, but in our uh, newsletter that's going out today after I'm done here, um, we'll have the other, like from city of North Las Vegas, uh, their press release, which I can forward to you if you want to. That'd be great. I just yeah. need it for Clark County as well, but because sure. um, I do have a an owner that wants, since I'm not gonna uh, submit a 30 day no cause, he would like to. <laughs> so I want to <laughs> shoot him out an email <laughs> and let him know. Um, I don't advise it <laughs> yeah. on that. And then the another question, just some insight. Uh, we have some property evaluations that are canceled and I have an owner that said, would the tenant mind doing pictures? And again, I saw something where the tenant doesn't have to do pictures as far as a sale goes. How do you feel about doing annual evaluation tenant pictures? You can ask them to send you pictures. That's okay. But if they say no, you can't enforce them, right? So you could ask them to tour the house with their iPhone and send you a video or take photos that you can do that all day long even on occupied properties that have tenants in them now to show a prospective buyer, you could do that. That's like 
the comment from Chris, could I just have the tenant video the home for the appraiser? Yeah, you could ask, but if they say no, you can't do anything else. But so you could do your evaluations that way. Excellent. Well, I'll see you guys at two o'clock. This was fun. Well, well you won't see me at two, but I got a question. I got one more thing that our state president and our past president and our LVAR board of directors need to do. Can you all tell Tom Blanchard that he's not allowed to speak? <laughs> Be nice, Andrew. You know, well, bless I, his heart. I, I, I want to say I, that he is being inundated like crazy. And as he said last night on the video that he did for the association, he, he said, hey, there was no media training for going through this. Yeah. And he and Wendy are practically in a bunker in the middle of a war and i, I think we, i'm willing to give them some grace but i mean the, the the comment last night on the news is is very concerning and and i didn't see that on the news but i got i did get three text messages or facebook messages from people asking me about the market you know diving and i said i don't see that happening you know we'll be out of this in 30 to 60 days it'll be life as usual and I didn't know what they were referencing to, until this meeting. Look, I like Tom. I think he's a, a sweetheart. But to make a statement like that is just, is just nuts. Just remember, it's important who you vote for. And <laughs> no, one, no one is paid for any of this work. So Correct. Todd, Tom is literally, he is working down at that board. I mean, that's how dedicated he is. So I do understand the kind of issue it caused. But I do appreciate the time that put in. Can he help. issue a retraction? <laughs> yeah. You know, my mother says Tom's like mold. He grows on you. <clears throat> you know, that's just how he is. Here's the thing too. He, sometimes things are taken out of context and all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, we just give him the benefit of the doubt and we move, move forward. And there's a lot of, a lot of news out there. So that'll be a small bump. I think the only people that are going to remember Tom's interview are us. So, um, that's true. I didn't even watch it, but now I'm going to. Yeah, right? Now I'm mad. <laughs> you should make one of those remix, 35%, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And I just want to say the association is doing a fabulous job. I mean, we're getting emails, you're getting texts, you're getting videos all day long. And what you need to understand is that this may change once Wendy evaluates the governor's orders that pertains to the association. But right now, they are working every day with 25% staff. There's always one person there from each department, but she thinks he's now saying, you need to send your staff home. So she's gonna be having conversations about that today. So they're, but they're working overtime. I mean, I told Chris before any of you got on, my messages were going ding, 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 ding till 10 o'clock last night when I finally put my phone on silent and went to bed and uh, they're working and they're under a lot of stress and they're under a lot of pressure but they're mm -hmm. trying their best to keep you informed and be as transparent as we can possibly be it's a stressful time for everybody yeah. um, but with that being said we are going to close this up but we are back here at two o'clock so if any of you want to join us same link um, love to see it too so. Same